All right, so I think we're going to begin. Uh, so I just started the recording. So please note that um, this is a style, again, this is a webinar style format. Um, so uh, you won't be able to turn on your video or unmute yourself. Um, if you would like to uh, ask a question or communicate, you can uh, definitely feel free to use the question, uh, the Q&A chat at the bottom. And um, so yeah, so again, Peyton Homiak is my name. I'm the environment coordinator with the city of St. Albert. And I am so happy to have Carrie O'Shaughnessy join us here today. She is a riparian specialist with the Cows and Fish Organization. And uh, she has a wealth of knowledge of all things beavers. So we're really grateful for you to be here with us today. And I'll hand, hand it off to you. Great. Wonderful. Thanks, Peyton. And thanks for everybody for joining us tonight. I'm excited to um, bring this topic of living with beavers. So let's just get things started here. So I'd like to first um, start off with Having everybody who's on the webinar tonight, just answer a couple of questions here right away. Just sort of, the first one is what best describes you and the hat you're wearing this evening. And just gives us, a, or gives me a sense of who's with us tonight and um, what type of uh, questions we might get. And then there's another, if you scroll down uh, within that same poll, there's a second question, just kind of giving you and giving us an idea of sort of where you're starting out in terms of uh, your understanding of beavers, their ecology, their role and influence on the landscape, challenges, management options, all the things that we're going to touch on uh, tonight. So it's a self-assessment and um, wherever you think you're at is great. All right, looks like pretty much it stopped moving. So we have a good range of folks. Wonderful and a good range of knowledge. Excellent. I hope to have something for everybody. So the... Um, I'm pleased to be part of the sort of the Wild About Wildlife and Living with Beavers a webinar series that City of St. Albert and Sturgeon County are putting on um, together for your, for, uh, your um, learning pleasure. I am um, a riparian specialist with Cows and Fish, as Peyton said, and I am bringing this webinar to you as part of my work with Cows and Fish, as well as um, my work with a collaborative that we call Working with Beavers that I will touch on in a minute. So the Working with Beavers Collaborative is an effort between the, Mis the Mistaki Institute and our organization, Cows and Fish, to bring um, increased awareness, understanding of, of what beavers can do for us on the landscape, as well as some of the challenges and solutions that we might be able to bring to the beaver conversation and lastly, looking into some different research tools and uh, and si answering, trying to answer some scientific questions around having beavers on our landscape. So I do need to um, acknowledge the current funders of the collaborative, which include a number of organizations like the Alberta government's Watershed Resilience and Restoration Program, Alberta Innovates, the Calgary Foundation and Alberta Ecotrust and also our local partners that include uh, municipalities, counties and landowners, as well as Blood Tribe Land Management and Peak County Nation Lands Department. So I do want to let you know a little bit about Cows and Fish, so the organization that I work for. We're also known as the Alberta Riparian Habitat Management Society, and our goal is healthy and functioning riparian areas for the benefit of all. If you haven't heard that word riparian before, not to worry, we'll get to it in a minute. And our mission is to promote healthy landscapes by fostering the riparian stewardship of those that are working, um, living and playing out on the landscape and making decisions. So riparian areas are the green zones of water loving vegetation that exist around our water bodies. 
And so they might be around a lake, might be around a wetland, might be around, you know, just a, a pond, as well as a stream or a river. And so the water influence that's present there influences the vegetation, influences the soils, and just influences the way that those areas grow. Now, interestingly enough, where we've got water, where we've got trees, where we've got shrubs, where we've got cattails, we also have the potential for beaver. And they are, uh, we find a, a critical part of the riparian uh, puzzle. And that's why I'm excited to bring it to you today. So a bit of an overview of what we're gonna touch on. So uh, we're going to bring a brief introduction to beaver history, biology, behavior, ecology, challenges, solutions, and options, and touch on some awareness materials and other resources for you to follow through uh, with if you'd like. This is sort of a, a condensed version of a longer workshop that we do that is um, up to a half of a day that goes into some more details around each of these elements around living with beavers on our landscape. And if that's something that folks are interested in on the call uh, on the webinar tonight, uh, we could follow that up in the future with um, another event. So let's talk a little bit about beavers um, in terms of where they've sort of come from and evolved with on our landscape. So several thousand you know, years ago, there was a large beaver on the landscape that was about the size of a black bear. And they weren't dam builders um, at that at the time when they sort of in the Pleistocene age when they were uh, running around, but they were very large and they did still have big teeth and chew things. Since then, you know, those uh, beavers have obviously disappeared, but we've been left with our modern beaver. And our modern beavers are more like a, you know, 20 kilogram size or so. And really their Latin name is called Castor Canadensis. And so with that name, um, it gives them an idea, or gives us an idea that they might have a bit of a connection to Canada. So they're on our money. They're in business. They are, um, you know, throughout throughout North America um, as well. So in terms of Canada and Alberta, you know, the, 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 the prevalence and the importance of beaver in our landscape just shows up on some of our county signs, shows up on some of our parks and recreation signs, um, is present in some of the names of our towns as well. So I think that gives us again an idea that although we may not see many of them now, they have been a critical part of um, our, our landscape and our development of not only the province, but of the nation as well. So if you aren't aware, the uh, Europeans in the early 1500s or so had a fashion trend that really liked beaver pelt hats. So they, they were using the, the, the pelt for, for, for hat making, for fashion, and um, now maybe not so popular, you know, in terms of the um, the top hat style, but our Stetson hat that uh, many of our, you know, uh, that are iconic in the in the West are still made with beaver pelts. So once the Europeans had extirpated, which basically means taken, um, or, you know, uh, reduced the population of their beavers, uh, enough that they couldn't, you know, sort of, sort of supply that uh, fashion trend anymore. They ended up coming over to North America, and um, the fact that they came here suggests that at one time we had probably millions of beavers roaming our landscape that were able to sort of feed into that that fur trade, fur in, feed into those early businesses of the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company to essentially create and establish an economy in Canada. So that fur trade ultimately resulted in um, severe population decline for the beavers that were here at that time. And down to the, to the point where they essentially were extirpated in a lot of the areas. So there were very, very few left um, and the landscape looked very, very different after that. So in um, sort of this Western, in Western Canada, there was some uh, reintroduction of beaver that started in the early 1900s, kind of uh, mid to uh, early to first third of the 1900s. And this was an effort to try and uh, restore beaver back on the landscape. The fur trade at this time had, 
had dwindled and the price of pelts were not, not so great um, at that time, but it was an effort to sort of bring back that iconic uh, figure on our landscape and get, uh, see if they could re become reestablished. So if we think about it, if, pe if the people came to uh, over here to, uh, to, to get these beavers and, and get their pelts, there must have been a lot of them. And the landscape likely looked completely different. So if you can imagine in this image here, you know, that entire yellow area at one point was probably or could have been treed or shrubbed or just at least more wet. Because with the, with the beavers on the landscape, there generally was more water uh, and it generally was in a lot more places. Water didn't move just in straight lines. It kind of fanned out across, across the landscape. So since then, a lot of our channels have become, have, have become straightened. Our floodplains have become drier as a general as a general rule. And it's hard to imagine because for most of us, this has kind of been the norm. So currently right now, uh, the, the idea of beaver is still um, in a lot of ways that they are a pest, they are a nuisance and they are a problem. And that the, you know, some people have used some very unflattering names for this little 20 kilo, you know, this 20 kilogram rodent that is actually um, pretty, pretty good at what they do. So in the last maybe quarter of a century or so, we've had the chance of, uh, we've had more and more people, I guess, thinking about baby beavers in a different way. As we've had more climate variability, you know, um, higher floods, higher, more intense floods, longer and more intense drought, you know, maybe there's a way that we could use this creature that is doing these things on our landscape that we're going to talk about that might be able to be, do, be able to help us out um, to manage and mitigate some of these challenges that we're facing. So then they become an ecosystem uh, engineer and more of a positive uh, piece on the landscape. So what do beavers like to do? So they like to impound water for safety and access to food. And they like to cut trees for food, dam, and lodge building. Ultimately, that's their goal. Their goal is to do these things so that, so that they can survive. And that sometimes causes some conflicts with the way that we like to do things, but we'll get to, we'll get to that in a little bit. But there were uh, some of the questions that were previewed. I uh, did talk a little bit about, you know, sort of what do beavers do? Why do they do it? And I thought I'd focus the part, the first part of this presentation on some of that. So beaver are known as the bucktooth animal. They've got those long orange iron infused teeth that are harder on one side than the other. And that is part of the reason that they chew is because they need to keep those teeth uh, from growing too long. And if they don't chew, they will eventually grow and they tend to grow, you know, sort of in a bit of a, a curve and will eventually sort of puncture themselves underneath if they don't do that. In terms of how many beaver are out there, as a population estimate for beaver in Alberta right now is unknown. Uh, we don't have an exact number. Fish and Wildlife doesn't have an exact number either. Um, but a typical beaver colony that would be, you know, living in a pond, uh, for example, would be two adults, two young of the year, and then the two-year-olds from the last year. That um, sort of makes up that family at any one time. So the beaver lodge is that mound of sticks and mud that you might see out in the open of a wetland or of a lake. And, or you might also see the mound of sticks and mud along the side of a river bank or a stream bank. And so there are bank lodges and there are sort of island lodges and that is the beaver home. So they spend their time here resting, right, hiding from predators, um, raising the kits, which are the, are the young ones. And um, this is basically their home and the pond and water around it is kind of like their moat to their castle. So at about the age of two, the two-year-old kids will leave the lodge 
And generally they will travel whatever distance they can go to try and make a new go of it. So um, if you've all of a sudden got new beaver activity with happening in your area, you know, sometime around May, June, uh, it very well could be that a young beaver has left his left its home and is trying to make his own way. Sometimes uh, a family of beaver will allow the kits to stick around a little bit uh, or stick around closer. And so that's when you can start to have sort of multiple families in the same area. But as a general rule, these beavers are territorial. So unless they're related, a new beaver coming into an area is often going to be chased out, attacked, um, threatened to, to basically say that this area is occupied. And so again, if you're walking along a stream or around a wetland and you see this mound of, of dirt uh, and soil beside, uh, beside a water body, that's typically a scent mound. And that's the beaver marking their territory and letting uh, other beavers know that this area is taken and they should just move on or try and stick around at their own risk. Um, so beavers are herbivores. So what they're eating is the cellulose and material that exists in, in woody trees uh, or woody plants for the most part. They eat the cambrium layer that is under the bark. So particularly in the fall, if again, you're out walking and you see a lodge with a bunch of sticks on the, you know, sort of floating on the water, that's their food cache. That's their winter food supply. And that's um, typically going to last them throughout the winter. So the sound of running water and the feel of running water is typically what gets a beaver's sort of dam building mode kicked in. And that's maybe something that a lot of uh, people that are here tonight might recognize. You know, there's a, a stream, then there's this, again, a big pile of sticks and mud, and then um, a big pond behind it. So these dams uh, vary in size, they vary in, in, in shape, but they're typically a combination of mud, sticks, um, anything that can be rolled, moved, packed in to essentially impound water. Because remember, what they're trying to do is maintain their survival, survival by creating a pond that's deep enough that they can overwinter, as well as escape uh, from predators throughout the summer. So a lot of times these dams are built from uh, materials that are just right close by. So that could be, you know, aspen trees or willow trees or willow shrubs, my apologies. Um, they'll also use um, other materials as well. Things like cattails, um, things like rocks. And so as, as I mentioned, anything that they can do to make a dam that can stop uh, or can slow down the water and create a pond for themselves. So typically when there is the combination of of woody material and mud available. The sticks uh, sort of add the structure to the dam and that mud is sort of like the packing material. It's the thing that sort of holds everything together. But interestingly enough, these dams are typically not 100% solid. There's water moving through them, under them, around them. Sometimes we can see that water and sometimes we can't. But that's what allows um, these dams to sort of stay in place. They're naturally leaky. The beavers build them that way. And that's a an engineering technique that they use to reduce the pressure of the water behind the dam so that it doesn't blow out as often. And as long as there's a beaver sort of maintaining a dam in an area, it's typically gonna stay in place. And like a lot of things in nature where there's one, there's many. So the beaver dams are typically built in succession, sort of around one around the the primary pond where the lodge is, and then some secondary and tertiary dams downstream or upstream that help them with access to food and, um, and escape from predators. So in a summary, you know, they need an adequate supply of water. They like a gradient that isn't too fast so that they, they, can, they can keep up with it in order to, uh, to, to slow it down on their own. 
Uh, valley width can be, you know, not too wide, but they're also highly variable and they're very adaptable and will show up in, in places that are very, very different from this. Um, and they also do like aspen and willow as sort of their, their primary and favorite food supply. So question for you guys, what proportion of a beaver's annual diet is wood? I like that the answers are coming in. All right, so we've got the majority of a, a tie of folks thinking that it's 53% or 86% with a smattering of the other, uh, other choices. So those, hmm. <laughs> Those who said 53% are absolutely right on the annual basis. So that's kind of an, it averages out that way because in uh, summer and spring and summer, when they're out foraging, they will also eat things like cattails, water lilies, grasses, sedges, some of the non-woody plants. And then ultimately once fall hits and they begin to build their, uh, their food cache, that is gonna be primarily the, the trees and the shrubs that uh, that um, it make that makes up that wood because they're going to last underwater and hold their pro hold their content uh, nutritional content throughout the winter. So when a beaver takes down a tree, and again, this is uh, sort of a combination of, of observations and experiences that we've gathered from from people as well as research. Uh, most trees hit the ground and they will use whatever they can carry uh, or float or move to help with lodge and dam building. And then they'll often chew off, you know, the bark, uh, the bark to get at that, that under layer on um, anything else that might be too big, but is still sort of on the ground. They generally like a tree that, you know, is, you know, maybe like what we would call a, a sapling or a pole size. So maybe three or four inches around, but as many of you may know, they will also go after larger ones as well. And they typically like to keep close to their their lodge pond um, and their and their sort of and their their series of ponds. Again, that's because the farther away they get from that water uh, onto land, they're pretty awkward on land. Um, that their risk of predation goes up. So if they can sort of stick within you know a thirty to fifty meter range, that's good. That's going to be happy for them. And that's often why they, uh, because they're not so great on land, they also build those uh, most channels and tunnels that sort of radiate out from a beaver pond. So again, that allows them access to uh, food further out in a safe environment. The two of their favorite foods, their primary foods are willow and aspen. And actually those uh, two trees, um, and shrub species sort of evolved with beaver in our landscape. So willow, if it's cut by a beaver, will sprout new, new shoots um, relatively quickly. And that is a regenerative technique for the plant, but also for the beaver food, because they're, once that, that, um, that willow is cut, it will then grow again, and the beaver can come back and get, uh, get that tree again in the future. Aspen, similar thing. Uh, when they're cut down, they also send out uh, shoots and sprouts, and they also, within their bark, uh, have a taste that is not great when they're in that young stage. So that sort of allows that tree or that shrub to recover from being cut and then regenerate over time, and the beaver can come back as they, say, as they tend to do. So beaver do go in cycles in their natural uh, natural environment, uh, even without human intervention. So sometimes they will get busy and eat themselves out of house and home, and then that's their cue to move on. 
typically the uh, a dam will stay in place as long as the beavers are there and active on it. But once they do go, that's when those dams typically fail in a natural setting. They'll also sometimes um, what we call blowout in you know a high water event. You know some of these extreme events that we've had that we've had where if it's a young dam, for example, a relatively new one, it might not be uh, strong enough to hold some of those uh, some of those uh, some of those flows. But typically, you know, in a in an area where beaver are well established and you know sort of have been in an area for a long time, those systems are typically more stable than um, than ones where a new beaver has moved in, for example, or if they have to keep replacing a dam or, or things like that. Um, because once they're sort of there and um, and stable, they're essentially just in maintenance mode. They're getting enough food and um, taking enough trees to maintain their lodge and maintain the dam instead of starting from scratch every time. And it's this ponding cycles of water levels going up and going down, you know, evaporation, you know, rain, snow melt, that sort of create the, uh, some of our wetland areas, a lot of our uh, rivers and floodplains have influence from beavers over time, the cycles of beavers over time. And um, ultimately that's how a lot of our riparian areas have been created. So for an organization like Cows and Fish, who, um, if I didn't mention, is a not-for-profit organization, and we are sort of building awareness around riparian areas and why they're important, and then beaver fall into that category because they are ultimately creating areas that are influenced by water. So through the years, as we've had uh, less beaver on the landscape, combined with other management, techniques, whether it be grazing management or infrastructure development, um, you know, uh, recreational trails, that sort of thing. The, our streams and rivers and the landscape in general have gotten a lot uh, drier and have less ability to hold water. When beavers have been present on the landscape and where they are, a lot of times those streams are able to recover and come back and restore that water holding capacity, restore that soil moisture, and restore that habitat. And part of the job, I guess, of these riparian areas is that they um, can be a filter for, for water quality. So being able to slow down water, prep sediment, let that sediment settle out, um, you know, any soil or, or uh, pollutants that might be running off the land can get utilized by the, by the plants that are living around these riparian areas and can also settle out uh, in the pond itself. So they're like little water, uh, mini water treatment plants kind of scattered all, ar all around the landscape. And this is good for humans, it's good for livestock, it's good for fish, and it's good for just water quality in general. So if we think of our landscape as it can be pretty messy, can be pretty um, dirty sometimes with, with sediment running off of our roads or running off of trails or coming um, off of uh, areas that don't have any vegetation, those beaver ponds act as sort of uh, catch basins. And so, you know, up to 382 tandem dump trucks of sediment or soil can be trapped within these beaver ponds. So if we just think about that, that can be um, a huge difference for water treatment costs, for example. If the beaver ponds are, are filtering and capturing that sediment and the plants that are there are, use, are using it and everything's sort of moving quite slowly, the water's not rushing away, eroding things, um, then we should have less uh, issues treating the water that we might need to use or maybe that our livestock need to use. So ultimately, you know, having those those beaver ponds on the landscape, just like having any other wetlands or riparian areas next to streams and rivers, it helps with uh, reducing water quality and increasing the amount of carbon that might be stored in those soils as well. So when we're talking about, you know, sort of slowing water down, I'll, I'll sort of get to my uh, major reason for chatting about this in, in just a second. Um, but really it's about reducing erosion and slowing down water. So keeping water on the landscape longer 
so that it can soak in, restore our groundwater aquifers, which, you know, if you live on a farm, you might, uh, or an acreage, you might have a well. And that could be where some of your, your water comes from is those groundwater stores. They recharge the shallow groundwater that plants and crops and, and things use. And they also lower the rate at which water moves. So ultimately they sort of um, reduce our flood peaks and then uh, have more water in the system afterwards. And sort of related to making that investment in what kind of water we have in the landscape, particularly as we're coming into a time that is going to, is, is pretty dry, um, sort of entering a, a prolonged drought situation, having more water where we can get it is going to be pretty important. So there's some interesting work that's been done right actually in this area around Edmonton that shows you know, air photo comparisons by Dr. Hood and Dr. Bailey, that two very dry years, 1950s and um, I think it was early 2000s. So 1950s, beaver weren't back on the landscape in this area quite yet. And by 2000, early 2000s, there were definitely more of them. And what they found was that even in the drier years that were later on in the second part of their study, there was more water particularly open water and ponds in the landscape in their study area. And that was primarily attributed to the water in beaver ponds. So having that water as, a, as an option for livestock watering, having it as an option for wildlife refuges, having it as an option, you know, even for, for fish to be getting around and into is, is, is key and important for keeping, you know, sort of things resilient and being able to bounce back. So if we think about the water that is stored by these beaver ponds, it's not always just what we can see on the surface. Yes, they often will flood an area uh, that would have otherwise been, you know, maybe drier, uh, but they're also influencing a lot of that groundwater that I talked about as well. So there's about, you know, five to 10 times more water underground that beaver pond than uh, you might be able to see at the surface. And this also helps influence and prolong water uh, flow downstream because as maybe we get less rain, if we've got water stored in our soils and in within the aquifers, that water can then sort of be released out into, uh, into the streams and rivers to keep them flowing and keep them cooler. And again, sort of maintain that more perennial flow. And as we get into what I would call, uh, you know, an, a time of increased variability in terms of the moisture that we're going to get or that we're getting, uh, being able to capture and hold that water where we can uh, becomes a really important uh, piece of the way that um, our landscape might be able to function and also keep some of our, you know, economic drivers going. Even recreation, for example, you know, needing to, some people, we need to have water so people can kayak and boat and canoe and things like that, not only um, as well as raves livestock and raise crops. The other element of having this, ex this, uh, this extra or having water on the landscape is the concepts of wildfires. So there's some really, really interesting research that's coming out of, um, out of the states that shows, you know, the impact of beaver uh, influenced systems when there's fire um, and then how that compares to where beavers are not. And you can see within these two, uh, these two images that ultimately it comes down to how much water uh, the, on the streams with the beavers on the right-hand side, how much water is in the system and how that's influencing the vegetation, keeping it wetter. If it's wetter, it doesn't burn as intensely um, or has a lower risk of burning. And these uh, sort of wetter areas also provide refuges for wildlife uh, in, during wildfires as well. So in this image, you can see the stream on the right, or on my right anyways, uh, is sort of charred and burned right through. And on the other side where the beaver dam is present, there's more water, vegetation is greener, and you know things would have been able to, to hide in there or escape or come, come here for a drink after more of the landscape has been, uh, has been burned. So that sort of links us into the biodiversity and habitat piece. 
beavers are considered a keystone species. So that basically means that they create habitat for a lot of other things. Um, so having that, that food, water and shelter available uh, right within those beaver ponds um, and, and the vegetation that they create is important for you know a lot of things. Everything from great blue herons and butterflies and moose and bears and a variety of things will utilize these beaver pond areas as well as riparian areas uh, in general. And I don't know if you know this, but I learned today that it's World Frog Day. So we want to celebrate our uh, little hopping creatures that definitely are, you know, inland or in water part of the time and out of, out of water part of the time. But they utilize these, um, these areas that are uh, influenced by water. And sort of those, the canals that I talked about and channels that, that beavers create is actually uh, significant for some amphibian species because it sort of increases the range that those animals can get to as well. Um, because they can, which provides genetic, genetic diversity, gives them, you know, additional habitats that they can get to. So those uh, two sort of um, features of, of beaver activity I can um, directly influence the amphibian populations that we have as well. And when we think about habitat, you know, I think it's important to think about how the landscape has changed in the last hundred years. Um, you know, 1920s around St. Albert, there was a lot of open land, a lot of trees, a lot of forests, a lot of shrubs, a lot of grasslands, and a lot of places that water was able to sit and store and sort of move slower. As we've increased um, development over time, you know, shifted the, the land cover that we have um, on our landscape, that has ultimately changed the habitat. And so where beaver are going to go are going to typically be, you know, where there's trees and where there's shrubs. So if we've reduced the area that they have and it's sort of coinciding with uh, where humans are, that's gonna potentially increase the potential conflict. So that's some of the sort of why beavers do what they do and why they can be important from um, sort of the broader landscape and um, sort of social and environmental benefits. There's cultural benefits as well. But let's talk about some of the challenges and then some of the things that we might be able to do to um, sort of maybe, maybe increase our tolerance for having beaver on the landscape where we can. So let me ask you first, what's your biggest issue or challenge with beavers on our landscape, if you have any? You might say nothing, we get along just fine. And that's okay. Got a range, so there's some flooding concerns and challenges. Changes in flows downstream, cutting down trees, blocking culverts, which I imagine could lead to some flooding or just water movement challenges. Some say you haven't had any issues or challenges with them. All right, good, so good, good range. And that tends to be the, the nature of our beaver friends. Um, if you haven't really had an issue with them, um, typically your outlook uh, for them is positive. If they've caused you some challenges or caused you some problems in the past, then your outlook might be a little more negative. So, just like you guys identified, there are definitely challenges of having beaver and human in the same space. So some of those things might be flooded uh, pastures, could be blocked culverts, which leads to flooded roads, um, fence lines that um, may have get more water on them than you'd like, um, you know, chewing things, including trees that might be in our yard or might be in parks. Um, and they chew other things too. They like to chew PVC pipe sometimes, or they like to chew 
telephone and internet wires sometimes. So that is in their nature. And like I said, they're very adaptable and they can be opportunistic too. They might just use, uh, use whatever's available. So the most common approaches that have been used to sort of manage or, mi or mitigate these problems have been to remove the dams and unclog the culverts when, uh, the, when there's flooding issues and then also remove the beaver. So deterrence like, um, you know, um, blowing up those dams or, or taking them apart uh, with machinery or by hand, and then also removing the animal, whether that animal is used for fur or for, uh, for some other purpose. Typically, those two are the sort of the most uh, common, what we'll call traditional ways of dealing with uh, beaver problems, but there's a whole other suite of things that are being learned about that could also be used, where uh, maybe there's a situation where you want to be able to keep the water, but the, the flooding issue you want to try and mitigate, um, or, or something like that, or you've got trees and you've got a few that you want to protect. So those are what we call coexistence tools. So these are ways to uh, maintain beaver and their benefits on the landscape but try and reduce the risk or reduce the issue that they might be uh, posing. Um, they are, could the, the idea of coexistence tools are, I would say, you know, relatively new in, in Alberta in terms of the history of what we've been doing to, to take care of beaver and, um, or beaver issues. Probably, you know, last 30 years or so maybe, and uh, particularly in the last, 10 or 15 where we've uh, sort of been becoming more aware of them and uh, more of the benefits and getting more information about them. So my next question for you, have you tried any ways to coexist with beaver? And sort of did it work if you did? So these would be any ways that you tried to, again, sort of maintain the beaver uh, activity or the pond, um, but we're trying to reduce a, reduce an issue. And if you haven't done anything, we do have that sort of neutral in the middle, haven't really, haven't had to do anything. They haven't bothered me much. Okay, again, a good range. Okay. That one is good. Okay, interesting, great. So let's talk about some of these ways that we can, can do it. We'll go big picture first, which is essentially if we've got the space, got the habitat, got the places where these beavers can be, let's let them have the creek or let them have the wetland. Let's give them that habitat. Let's let them do their thing. Uh, where we can. So if you happen to be out in the out uh, in the ag in the um, agricultural areas, you know if you've got the ability to make larger pastures that incorporate your entire creek bottom, for example, that gives you the flexibility to at a time when beaver might be present, um, just let them have it. And in other times, you know, open the gate, allow the animal, you say your cattle in there or something like that to graze those areas when it's when it's drier or when beavers have moved on, or maybe you want to use that water for your livestock watering options. If you've got trees or shrubs or particular places that you would like those beavers to be, you could invest in some um, buffet provision. So, you know, cut down some trees or take some branches from somewhere that you're okay with, or maybe the roadside, for example, and then provide though that feed as a, as a source for those viewers to access. It's easy for them to get at. They don't have to take down the trees that um, you might wanna keep. And this is uh, labor intensive, absolutely. Uh, so you've got a small area, it's something that could be done. And there are, there are people out there that are doing that. And um, also thinking about, you know, that sound of running water, you know, 
we've had some people try putting a tape recorder in a particular spot where they want those people to build, where those beavers to build, um, instead of say on the culvert, for example. And the beaver will go and bury that tape recorder and start building that on that dam in that location. Just don't use anything too expensive because you might want to get that back. In terms of trees, uh, definitely wire wrapping is a common practice and there are some ways to do it that are better than others. Definitely using a higher gauge wire so that uh, th that wire is more sturdy, making sure it's uh, flat on the ground and tall enough. So of, you know, up to a meter in places that beaver can't climb up onto snow and chew that tree uh, in the winter time. And then also ensuring to give when you you are wrapping to give that tree room to grow. So wrapping wider than just the size it is today. In terms of sort of managing culverts, there are a few um, ways to do that. One is uh, these beaver proof add-ons that are, uh, you know, a T culvert, which is an extension onto a metal culvert that uh, basically encloses the culvert completely so that the beaver don't have an opening to, uh, to plug up and water can still flow and move. So that's a barrier to that beaver activity. And examples of these are around the province and uh, some of these municipalities are actually seeing cost savings um, from doing these types of things. This one was done when uh, a road was being reconstructed and uh, they've saved five to ten thousand dollars annually in this case from having to go back to that have to go having to go back to that spot you know sometimes weekly to clear that culvert other ways um, are culvert exclusion fences so these are uh, a technique that are typically in a trapezoidal shape when you've got enough room to uh, to create kind of a, a fence around it um, sometimes beaver will dam on that fence and if you can withstand still a little bit of flooding but the culvert is clear then that might be okay if you aren't able to withstand that flooding and the beaver continue to to dam on that fence um, you can do what we call a combination and add a, uh, a pond leveler pipe that keeps water moving through but um, reduces the damming or the beavers can still dam and the last one I want to touch on is uh, pond levelers. So that pipe that you saw in that last photo, that's what's called a pond leveler. And essentially it's a 40 foot length of double walled pipe that um, extends the outlet end at the dam side. And then the inlet end is upstream protected by a cage that um, the height of the pipe on the outlet end sets where that pond was going to end up flowing to. So that's how you can mitigate flooding, but maintain that pond. So water will still flow in high flows over the dam, but then it, as uh, you know, spring runoff uh, recedes, the water will still continue to move through that pipe and carry on downstream until it gets to that um, that level that you that you're set that keeps you happy and keeps the beaver happy. Just some um, examples of what that pond what a pond leveler might uh, might look like and how you might get it in there. They're uh, a bit tricky, but they can be done. And none of these uh, tools are uh, maintenance free. So I just want to remind you that, you know, there may be chances where the beavers outsmart us and, uh, and there may be some adaptations that, that, that need to be made. Uh, but that's part of the, the learning and part of the maintenance and monitoring of these, um, these projects. And again, cost savings um, are, have been shown by different uh, areas within the province, as well as uh, the states, where uh, shifting to coexistence tools versus traditional management of dam removal and um, trapping, shooting, or hunting the, the, the beaver out has, uh, has resulted in, in saving, um, saving money. So there's another uh, sort of aspect of beaver is actually using the uh, like a mimicry technique, so creating beaver dams, like humans going in and constructing these dams that will then mimic the, uh, the qualities that we've talked about um, that beavers might do naturally. So I did just wanna point out that if you are doing or want to do any of these things, there may be a regulatory 
uh, considerations or you might have to get permissions or approvals from some of our federal or federal or provincial um, um, government departments in order to allow those things to happen. If you're a private landowner, uh, you are able to uh, remove a dam or, or, or uh, remove a beaver um, on your land or through uh, an authorized trapper or person uh, without approval. But if you want to try and maintain uh, these activities, then uh, then you, you more than likely will require approval, if that makes sense. So as far as, you know, the potential changes and shifts in climate that we've got coming, um, I think there's a role for, for beaver on our landscape and a, an opportunity for those of us that are living um, in these areas and making decisions where beavers are to think about ways that we might be able to, to keep them on our landscape. Um, so, so some of the um, resources that I just wanted to point you guys out to is um, on the Cows and Fish website. There are some general riparian management um, and you know, understanding riparian areas information there that uh, you're more than welcome to, to get. You can get paper copies or take them um, digitally. There's also specific beaver um, awareness materials and um, a lot of what was presented tonight came from uh, some of these resources. The Working with Beavers website has additional uh, fact sheets, videos, you know, sort of how to's, different, uh, different, different stories about where some of the coexistence tools, for example, have been utilized. If you want to uh, get on the beaver mailing list to learn more about what the Working with Beavers Collaborative is up to, uh, there's a contact for you there. And there's also a map of tools to see different projects that have uh, been going on around the province. Um, a few acknowledgements. Uh, a lot of uh, people have provided information that have sort of fed into the overall beaver awareness materials that Cows and Fish and Mistaki have, have developed. Um, the funders again, and uh, the Cows and Fish members and supporters as well, I want to thank uh, for allowing me to bring this information to you tonight. Um, so, We'll go into questions, I think. Um, got a couple of minutes, maybe Peyton. Um, and then uh, if anybody has to, maybe we'll put the, the survey up. And if anybody has to go, um, before you go, please answer the post survey uh, questions. And um, we will, uh, well, sort of while, the, while that's happening, I mean, if there's any questions, uh, we can take a few minutes and answer them. Thank you, Carrie. That was very informa informative. Um, we do have one question about uh, what do Indigenous people teach us about the beaver? Yeah, great question. There are um, some deep cultural connections to, to beaver that I have learned through conversations um, with First Nations uh, peoples that they have told me about. Um, in, in some of the cultures, they are, uh, beaver are considered sacred, uh, a sacred animal. And so they do what they can to try and maintain them uh, in their landscapes. And um, in, uh, in others, they may have a different perspective, but uh, definitely uh, beaver has played a, a huge role in, um, in sort of the, the indigenous culture throughout the years, right from fur trade uh, to now and prior to that as well. 